cubic and sorry, thank you. Uh, the cubic and M Michele Ruta. Uh, we are going to have as a discussion Bernard Hockman from Florence, and uh, Professor uh, Bernard uh, will be the the person that will be in charge of the comments, and I will have. We will have plenty of time for Q&A with the authors of, of this program. As you know, um, Adam and Bernard both are working at, in IMF and their work on these issues are very interesting. I think it's a very interesting and provoking uh, article they are preparing. And I think the comments that we will have in this floor will be quite interesting for us that we want to improve the, the value of multilateral system. So without, Going further, I would like to give the floor to Adam. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Aros, for this uh, kind introduction. Let me share the screen here. Uh, So uh, do you now see the full screen? Yes, we do. In theory, it should be great. So um, yes, yeah, so we are pleased to present uh, this paper together uh, with Michele called uh, Trading with Friends in Uncertain Times. Um, this is a uh, yeah, joint work and um, the, the views um, expressed here are, are our own, not the IMF. It's the usual disclaimer. Um, so let me begin uh, going straight into the introduction. So what we do in this paper is I'll give a brief overview uh, first. So what we are interested in is um, asking the question how trade policy uncertainty uh, is reshaping the network of bilateral trade relationships. Um, and what is the role in this uh, process of, uh, of geopolitical um, alignments between countries? So um, I, I guess the, one of the motivations behind this is, is recent talk of uh, French shoring and, and near shoring and, um, and this kind of idea of whether uh, this clustering is, is, uh, is kind of happening automatically as, um, as uncertainty is rising and, and firms uh, uh, take precautions to, to avoid their exposure and avoid risk. So, um, the empirical analysis will be based on a pretty standard uh, gravity model where we include uh, variables which try to capture um, uncertainty and, and geopolitical distance. Um, and uh, we will uh, find in the end that, uh, that, these, uh, that uh, trade policy uncertainty in fact has uh, impacts on bilateral trade which are moderated by, uh, by geopolitical distance, but we will see this. Uh, shortly. So um, my way of motivation, um, I will have two slides on motivation. One of them is uh, related to the close link between trade and uh, international relations. Um, so the paradigm has has uh, always been that that uh, trade is promoting peace uh, through closer relationships within nations. And I guess what we uh, bring to this discussion is then the role of uncertainty in uh, in contributing to this um, and what reductions of uncertainty, especially multilaterally, can can contribute to this. Um, then the second motivation is just uh, basically recent events. Uh, so this is a, an index of world uncertainty, um, uh, policy uncertainty prepared by uh, colleagues here at the fund uh, together with uh, Nick Bloom. Um, and, um, this is a text-based analysis. So looking at um, the Economist Intelligence Unit's country reports and, and uh, looking for kind of um, words related to, to uncertainty and how they are trending. And we have seen that in, in very recent, uh, recent years, uh, this the share of trade in contributing to this index has spiked. Um, and, and again, very recently as well. Um, so this is the other motivation why why this is interesting to look at right now. Um, 
So let me uh, cover briefly how uh, the paper is related to the existing literature. So, um, well, we have known that uh, in theory, uncertainty uh, affects, uh, affects trade and investment because uh, it increases the option value of waiting. So it causes delays, uh, delays in, in entry, uh, you know, investment is required to, to enter new markets, to expand and so on. So all of this is is put on hold and delayed uh, because of uncertainty. And there, are, you know, kind of seminal papers uh, on this are by Dixit and and Bernanke in the eighties. Um, and then, you know, more recent empirical work has has shown that this is is actually the case. So these papers looked at several country specific instances where um, actual policies or actual trade costs. Uh, did not change at all, only the uncertainty around those policies, around uh, those trade costs. Uh, for example, uh, when Spain entered the, the European Economic Community or when uh, the US um, passed the permanent uh, normal trade relations for China or when the Brexit referendum took place. Um, so, the, you know, this is a vast uh, literature now, and uh, Hanley and Limao have a recent review of this uh, literature, which is very um, comprehensive. And then lastly, uh, we, um, our paper is also linked to institutions, because we look at the global trade policy uncertainty. And uh, we have a recent paper with uh, Roberta Piermartini, where we look at uh, how WTO rules um, interact with this. And of course, we, not, we all know that uh, uh, the WTO is currently kind of uh, weakened in, in its capacity to, to enforce these rules. So this is another interesting element which feeds into this. And then, um, of course, there have been also studies on the geopolitical aspect, uh, more on geopolitical risks. Uh, which have been measured so based on, on textual analysis and they ha have been shown to lower investment at the firm level and, and also on aggregate um, and also have been linked to higher trade barriers. Um, so with this, let, let me um, first uh, introduce the, the data and empirical methods and then we can uh, jump into the, to the results. So, what we do is we look at uh, trade flows between uh, uh, about 100, 186 countries. Uh, so this is uh, around uh, something like 34,000 uh, bilateral country pairs uh, trading with each other um, uh, in both both directions. So. Um, uh, and you know, and the, the 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 period we look at is the past two decades because of data. Um, but uh, it will, of course, be interesting to see how these things develop uh, in the very recent time period. But it's it's a backward looking uh, backward looking analysis. Um, so geopolitical distance we capture uh, by looking at uh, UN voting uh, patterns. So countries which vote very closely together uh, are considered uh, to have a short. Uh, this ideal point distance uh, and th this measure is, is based on some existing work uh, by by Voten and, and others um, and then for trade policy uncertainty we use uh, we use data from uh, colleagues at the fund and, and Nick Bloom so this is this uh, this um, uncertainty index that we uh, that I showed a few slides ago and, and we will have various versions of, of this uncertainty, uh, which we will discuss later in the results. Um, and then the specification we use to, to look at the impacts on bilateral trade flows, since we consider these, uh, these variables as, as trade costs, is the standard gravity um, specification. Uh, important to note that we include uh, the set of fixed effects um, including origin time and destination time, uh, which capture kind of general equilibrium uh, multilateral um, resistances. So capture general equilibrium effects. Um, and we include also bilateral fixed effects uh, to, to help um, with any omitted variable bias. So therefore we do not need to include things like uh, 
the distance uh, between countries and and uh, you know past uh, relationships, uh, colonial relationships, legal similarities, things like this that uh, um, that do not change over time. Um, so we hypothesize, of course, that these uh, that uncertainty will have a negative effect on trade uh, due to delaying uh, delaying investment. And we also hypothesize that this will be stronger when uh, geopolitical distance is is, uh, is larger. So let's uh, get the first set of results, and then I will explain uh, the the different uh, different variations that that we first try. So this this is the kind of general. Uh, result where we look at aggregate trade uh, and later we will look at sectors so um, for aggregate trade we use various versions of uh, of uncertainty here so in the first column we use uh, a simple average of, of this global trade policy uncertainty based on a simple average in the second one we give it's gdp weighted so we give more weight to larger countries um, in the last two columns we do the same but or instead of looking at the world trade uncertainty index, we look at the world uncertainty index, which captures also other types of uh, other types of policies. Um, so, looking at this, um, uh, our preferred specification is uh, is column two. Uh, we see that when we look at other types of policies, we have larger standard errors because probably well, the the magnitude of the estimates is very similar, but standard errors there are larger, probably because this is less targeted at trade. Um, and also, I think it makes sense to, to give more weight uh, to countries which influence uh, global trade policy uncertainty um, more. So, so, so naturally, our preferred specification is, is this column two. And we see that uh, geopolitical distance by itself doesn't matter. Of course, we include bilateral fixed effects. So we only look at the kind of variation over time in this measure, not uh, uh, you know, not the kind of existing uh, levels of, of 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 distance, but but only how it changes. And we see that uh, there is no no significant effect. Uh, the significant effect comes when uh, this is interacted with global uncertainty. Which means that in periods where um, trade policy uncertainty is high, uh, we see that it it impacts trade uh, negatively for for countries which are further apart. But let's uh, visualize this in the next uh, slide to see. So these are the the marginal effects, uh, the average marginal effects across the full sample. And and what this shows is that um, again, as I mentioned. Uh, so here, interestingly, the distance can be negative. This is because we normalize the, the variables. So here we look at uh, what a one standard deviation change in, in global uncertainty will, uh, um, what the impact of that will be. Um, and we see this kind of rearrangement. Now, one important thing to note is that uh, here, zero geopolitical distance is kind of the, is, is at the mean. So what we identify is actually effects uh, relative to the mean. So this, what this means is that um, as uh, uncertainty rises globally, this might have a negative effect on trade overall. Uh, we do not look at that. We only look at how um, this kind of clustering towards uh, closer and, and further apart. Uh, so the clustering towards uh, geopolitically closer countries happens. So kind of relative changes, not. Uh, levels and and what does this mean we, we look at the economic significance uh, of a one standard deviation shock which is from the previous uh, slide and and we see you know countries that uh, are at the 25th percentile uh, would have a one percent increase in their bilateral trade and then countries um, let's say at the 75th percentile uh, would have uh, um, so which are further quite far apart uh, would have a 0.7% uh, increase. But I think what's more interesting to look at uh, is looking at a shock to trade policy uncertainty of the actual size that that uh, took place in 2019. 
as we saw in the in the introduction um, this this spike uh, which was rather large and um, the effect of a shock of that magnitude uh, the predicted effects would be just for a couple examples uh, it would uh, dec decrease uh, bilateral trade between us and china relative to a neutral country or relative to what it would have been uh, if the distance would have been zero uh, by about 12.7 percent and then countries which are you know very close both in the eu germany and spain uh, would see uh, seven percent in relative increase uh, and you know this is just to illustrate uh, with a couple of examples um, but uh, adding up all of these effects, we would see that about 5% of global trade would be rearranged along these lines uh, with a shock of, of this magnitude. Uh, of course, you might uh, say, you know, th this is really to illustrate the results because uh, I think this kind of Lucas critique applies that, you know, these, these structural parameters might change as we go you know from the period that we estimated this model on to the the current period but but i think the direction and the and the the theoretical impact is still is still the same it's just uh, we we might see something different in in the in the current period um so now uh in the next slides we take apart uh, a little bit the results and uh, one question that uh would uh, come up very often is are these results driven exclusively by the us china trade and the answer is no um, they, they are more general than that uh, the uh, coefficient is slightly smaller uh, which you could expect but but they're not exclusively driven by us and china uh, when we look at the different time periods uh, we split um, the time periods into two we really see that this uh, result is driven by the post-2016 period. Um, of course, um, th this is a shorter period, but you know this this is uh, and this is basically where um, where where we see the most action. So that's that's also expected. Now, I think this slide is uh, quite interesting for for this group because we include. Uh, we test the robustness of the results by including a various uh, bilateral, um, various bilateral um, trade cost variables. Um, so we include uh, specific trade concerns that countries raise against each other at the WTO. Uh, we include uh, SPS measures, TBT measures. Uh, so some some NTMs here. Um, and 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 also co uh, contingent measures of protection. And uh, interestingly, so so the results are robust to to including these. And and interestingly, most of them uh, behave as expected. And you know, specific trade concerns. I don't think raising the concerns themselves are are have a negative impact, but they are a symptom of uh, of some underlying uh, concern, which which has a negative impact. Um, SPS uh, measures uh, have a positive impact. Uh, this is uh, interesting and something that, you know, it's not, this, we really add these uh, measures as a robustness check for the main results, but these are some results that, that are in and of itself uh, quite interesting and could be explored further. Also TBT has a negative impact. Anti-dumping, I don't know, probably there is some reverse causality but, or uh, it's very um, targeted by you know at certain countries and but uh, yeah something to explore further and then um, the last robustness check is we we also have data instead of global trade policy uncertainty uh, this data set um, includes also you know uncertainty measured by the origin country and destination country so we if we include one, the other, or both, uh, we, we see that uh, this negative interaction effect persists. Um, and also if we kind of bilateralize the measure by multiplying them, um, which, um, you know, we want to focus on the, the global uncertainty because we think that uh, that captures more multilateral level uncertainty 
whereas this these origin uh, or destination specific measures uh, might miss some of that. Um, but uh, nonetheless, they behave in the same way. Um, let me skip this. This is more exploring which part of the uh, distribution is, is driving the results. Um, let me go into the sectoral results. The first set of sectoral results, we look at some broad sectors, agriculture, manufacturing, mining and energy, and services. And interestingly, find uh, results are consistent, but uh, stronger maybe in mining and energy and do not seem to be significant in services. We think this might be because um, services already require such a, a level of um, uncertainty in order to be, uh, sorry, such a level of uh, policy certainty in order to be traded that, uh, you know, variations in this uncertainty are, you know, do not have a strong effect uh, on, on services. Also, the sample composition might be slightly different. So um, then uh, the last part of the presentation, uh, we also explore if the effects are different for what we call strategic sectors, uh, which have been identified uh, using uh, using a methodology in the, in the recent wheel. Um, of course, there, there can be alternative definitions as well. Um, so uh, Michele has this uh, nice recent working paper where he looks at the actual data for the US in particular um, for certain strategic goods. And, and he sees this kind of a, a pattern, which uh, is a bit reminiscent of the uh, marginal effects graph I showed earlier. Um, not exactly, but, uh, but uh, it's, it's a similar, similar idea. And so, uh, th this is simply capturing, uh, this is without any econometric, simply capturing patterns in the data. And we see some kind of rearrangement in the strategic goods market shares for the US. Uh, so this is part of the motivation for looking at strategic goods. Uh, so what we find in the end is that uh, strategic goods, although this uh, um, coefficient is, is, is larger in, in absolute terms, um, we do not see a st uh, statistically significant, strong uh, difference between between the two. Um, then, in some more granular analysis, we look separately at uh, you know, 113 disaggregated manufacturing sectors, and we see that the the average uh, coefficient for for strategic uh, goods is about 20 percent. Uh, larger in absolute terms but but again this is not uh, what what we'd really need to do is to include separate interactions for all of these uh, in one regression which might be very uh, cumbersome to uh, to run so that's uh, on strategic goods um, so with that let me conclude um, I think uh, this this was kind of a self-contained compact uh, exercise where we look at uh, the impact of these variables. Um, we see that uh, indeed geopolitical alignment seems to have some role when uncertainty is high on bilateral trade flows. And, and the takeaway from that is that, uh, you know, uh, reducing this uncertainty might be beneficial um, and stop this kind of clustering that is taking place. Let me stop there. Thank you, Adam. So we go to Bernard for his comments. Okay. So thanks, as uh, would be expected. Uh, this is a really interesting and nicely executed paper. And of course, it's on a very important topic. So. I'm not going to uh, be more complimentary. Let me just go through a bit of some of the things that arose in my mind as I was reading it. And I think a lot of this is probably, you know, things that you can think about in future work or in terms of expanding this in terms of where you want to go. So one, one 
kind of concern I had is this measure of trade policy uncertainty, right? So it's really based on the word uncertainty in EUI, in, no, not EUI, I'm at the EUI, the Economist Intelligence, EIU, country reports, right? And I think we all know how these country reports are put together. And essentially, we have very different people writing the reports. So it doesn't seem to me that you could be very convincing to say there actually is a common methodology and that these things are comparable. So I think there's going to be quite a bit of noise in there. So that also means I'm not really sure what you're picking up. So clearly, yes, you're finding something that's statistically significant, but in terms of what you're actually measuring is, is a bit nebulous. And as you say in the paper, I think it's important, and this is something you probably can't do using this data source, is to start unpacking what actually you mean by trade policy uncertainty. So what's the trade policy part? Uh, what are we actually talking about? So is this tariff man uh, creating a lot of uncertainty in, in the minds of people? And clearly you show that most of your results hold for the post-2016 period. So that's very much the Trump period and the trade war that uh, was launched, not, not just against China, but also against the EU, right? So that's there. Are we also including, you know, subsidies, uh, potential measures that are going to affect competitiveness? So so that's something that I, I, I worry a bit about. Um, clearly, you're only looking at uncertainty as defined in these reports. But levels obviously are going to matter as well, right? So what was actually done is going to determine, you know, these trade flows as well. So I think controlling for that, it's, you know, <laughs> it's obviously not something you can do with the current methodology, but I think it is something to, to, to think about. Similarly, with this IPD, this geopolitical distance variable, um, you know, I guess... That's hard to do, but one of the questions that came up there is how much variation is there actually in this over time, right? If, you, if you're looking at particular country pairs over time, you know, I would expect there not to be a whole lot there, but I would also expect to see probably more variation in more recent years. So there again, you know, I think this is one of the problems, of course, with doing this type of work using data that ends in 2017, 2019, Right, because clearly a lot of the action is happening after um, 2019. But I think you know, it's, it, you you go through what this IPD thing is very quickly. But I think some discussion of you know what that thing looks like, uh, how much variation there is in it, that, that would be good uh, to have. I think related to this, and I think this you have in the robustness uh, part uh, as a robustness test. So if you think about what changes between any country pair in terms of political, you know, friendliness, uh, likeness, geopolitical distance, whatever, you would expect that to be um, heavily influenced by whether the countries have trade agreements, right? So presumably countries that have deep trade agreements with each other, they're going to be very similar in terms of whatever distance measure on the political side you put in. And you're picking that up in the robustness uh, test, right, through these RTA measures. So I would throw that in the main text because I think that's one of the things that you know kind of pops into your head immediately, and that actually does have an effect in reducing you know the the, um, the coefficient estimate of this interaction between the trade policy uncertainty and your geopolitical distance uh, variable. So as you say in the paper, it's mostly the action is after 2016. So I think the really interesting bits are going to come, you know, once we can get data through 2021. Because um, I think one of the things that you can then do is to say, okay, we have this huge COVID shock. And does that, add, does that change anything in terms of these relationships between trade policy uncertainty and, and geopolitical uh, distance? The sectoral results, I think, are really interesting, uh, especially the services, kind of the fact that none of this matters for services, I think the uh, intuition you provide there in terms of why that might be, because it's much more heavily regulated. Um, it's obviously much less affected by the Trumpian type of uncertainty in terms of I'm going to smash, I'm going to put a lot of tariffs on your trade because that doesn't work for services. So there again, I think that's something to, to play up a bit in terms of uh, convincing people that there really is something here in the analysis. So a couple of 
ideas, which I'm not sure are, are feasible, but I think it's thinking about kind of extending this a bit. So if you go back to this measure of uncertainty, maybe another way of looking at uncertainty is really just variation in what's happening with respect to the use of trade policy. Right, and I think there you have the global trade alerts database. I guess Simon is gone, so I can't get paid for advertising the global trade alert. But that's one. And I think also, if you want to get it closer to another kind of conception of uncertainty, is you could maybe look at the difference between what countries are notifying to the WTO and what you see in the global trade alerts. Right. So insofar as there's a lot of differences there, you could say, well, there's actually you know, greater uncertainty insofar as countries that are highly activist, according to the global trade alert, and are not really notifying a whole lot. Well, that could also be interpreted as, you know, the signal there is, you know, life is becoming more un uncertain. Anyway, so that's just one idea. The other idea I had is given that a lot of the motivation for this whole uncertainty um, the effects of uncertainty on economic uh, activity really runs through investment. Why don't you get investment on the left-hand side uh, as opposed to just trade? Right now, obviously, having very detailed bilateral data on investment is a lot harder. But even if it's more aggregated, more macro, you know, we certainly do know what bilateral investment flows are. So I think that's something else you could look at uh, to see whether you actually see that uh, happening. Now, obviously. Over time, changes in bilateral trade are going to be heavily affected by what's happening, not so much in terms of bilateral investment, but it is going to be affected by overall investments. So, you know, if you read the newspapers, clearly there's a lot of investment going into Vietnam and out of China. Uh, so that's going to be then also reflected in trade. But I think the key thing is, given that a lot of the literature focuses on investments as, as the initial mechanism, why not look at investment uh, in the analysis? So that's that's all I had. It's it's a nice paper. So thank you, Bernard. Very interesting comments, and I I would like to add. You know, many you mentioned in the paper something that I really find interesting is uncertainty has more effect than the actual change of policy. So. This is a very interesting point to, to focus because some governments, for example, started to say, oh, we're going to denounce, we're going to go out of our ATAs now that we're going to change the policy. All this uncertainty is going on, for example, in Latin America about policy, the openness that used to have many of the countries that were in the, in the Pacific Alliance and things like that. So I found that this is an interesting point because many of their there are many announcements that not actual uh, changes in the uh, agreements that they have. So that's an, another point I would like to focus on too. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you, Adam. And um, Kelly, if you have some comments and the, the floor is open for questions, comments, uh, please raise your hand and I will give you the floor. Maybe I'll chat a second, quickly jump in yes. um, so that uh, people can take more time to think about their questions. Um, so first of all, uh, thanks a lot to Bernard because these are really, really excellent uh, uh, comments. So I just want to say that I completely agree with the first set of comments uh, that Bernard had, uh, which essentially fall in the category of uh, uh, we will need more robustness uh, um, on the using alternative measures, both of uncertainty and uh, uh, of uh, uh, geopolitical distance. And I, I, I would uh, certainly agree with that. In fact, uh, um, on the first one with, uh, with Adam, we were thinking about uh, possible future work, uh, refining the measure of uncertainty. So those are, those are all excellent uh, points. Um, I also agree very much that extending the period uh, as data come in uh, it would be very valuable, especially because a lot of uncertainty uh, is in the post-2019 um, period. And we, we, we saw that in one of the first slides that Adam put up. And, um, and I also just want to say thank you for the ideas of extensions, which are uh, really, uh, really valuable. One point where I wanted to um, emphasize uh, 
uh, is the one on uh, on um, on regionalism, uh, which I think it's uh, it, it, it's something that we had in the back of our minds, and in part is because I I think more or less at the same time as I was writing this paper, I was writing an, another piece for finance and development on on the rise of discriminatory regionalism. Um, and I think that uh, the, the two things, as Bernard noticed, uh, um, somehow go hand in hand. So when uh, uh, when you have a period of uh, higher geopolitical tensions and um, and uh, uh, higher uncertainty, uh, at the same time uh, uh, it's possible, and, and that's what I think is happening. The countries uh, um, tend to. Uh, use trade agreements to a larger extent, and especially they tend to use them in a different way. Um, so what we are observing right now is that while in the previous uh, 30 years, the trade agreements were mostly about reducing trade costs uh, um, between members, uh, more recently, they are um, increasingly about uh, increasing trade costs vis-a-vis non-members. And, and in practice, you, you see these uh, uh, with uh, um, uh, the increased use of discriminatory rules in trade agreements. Uh, these are things like uh, more stringent uh, um, rules of origin. You know, that was the main difference between NAFTA and the uh, USMCA was the, the more stringent use of rules of origin. Uh, you see that uh, in uh, uh, agreements like the US-Japan uh, Critical Minerals Agreement, which is one of the key features is to extend the, the local content requirements benefits that are in the IRA, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. So again, it's a, it's a, it's a discriminatory element that, that is introduced um, in the trade agreements, and there would be other examples. So th this is just to say that I I really agree with the fact that uh, um, uh, regional trade agreements matter in this uh, in this context. So let me just stop here because I, I actually more than talking, I think I prefer listening to the comments of others. So thank you so much. Thank you, Michele. And I will give the floor to Jonathan and then to Sherry for their comments. Well, let me begin by thanking uh, Adam and Michelle and of course, Bernard for his uh, um, <laughs> uh, insights to which we're well uh, accustomed. Um, let me preface my remarks by saying, even when I was executive director at the IMF, uh, being a non-economist, I used to insist that anything going to capitals that was going to be at a political level for digestion, we had to ban all Greek equations. Uh, because if the politician isn't going to understand it, the public isn't going to understand it, and thus socializing the ideas is somewhat uh, constrained. So a non-expert executive summary in the next version uh, would actually help. Let me uh, put my question by picking up where Michelle left off, which is uh, geopolitical distance is one thing, pure geography and a more traditional gravity models is another. In this era of de-risking uh, with or without uh, geopolitics, given all the vagaries of COVID, supply chain disruptions, blockage of the Suez Canal, and so on, there is in some sectors a pattern of nearshoring as an element of diversification and de-risking. With or without a trade agreement, the cost uh, and distance and proximity either to supply or to, or to customers uh, seems to be in the last few years, and this picks up on Bernard's point of looking from 2018 or 19 onward, seems to be a significant element, both uh, in terms of shifts in trade and investment. In a USMCA context, uh, Mexico is not the big winner as compared to Vietnam from a China perspective, uh, but it is gaining uh, significant investment, particularly in its border areas, in certain sectors, um, uh, whether Canada or Chile, you're seeing a tendency uh, in the electric vehicle area to look at who's the closer supplier with better infrastructure on lithium. 
even and other uh, metals that are relevant. And that's independent of, of geopolitics. So all of which is to say a question as to whether you can segregate out the geographic from the geostrategic uh, distance a little more explicitly in, in another version or whether it's hidden in the data uh, that I'm uh, not recognizing. I seem to recall brief this last point that very early on the IDB did some significant work on a gravity model of, uh, of trade on a geographic basis. And I don't know whether that's ever been updated on as comprehensive a basis as they did. Uh, so I'll stop there mostly to uh, uh, trigger uh, my further education. Thank you, Jonathan. Very interesting points. And then I give the floor to Sherry, the expert in services. <laughs> Thanks very much. I appreciate it. And I want to thank Adam and Michaele for really a very interesting paper and Bernard for excellent comments and Jonathan too. So I'm going to stop my video so that I can look at my notes. Um, and I guess what I want to focus on is a question related to services because that's obviously my focus area of interest. Um, and I believe that the author said that the results were not significant for services uh, because they require already a lot of certainty to be traded. I would want to examine that further. Um, maybe ask them to, again, just express this a little further. Uh, of course, some services may require certainty. I understand that those that are connected to testing and research and production of strategic goods will require certainty. But I mean, the majority of services or a lot of services I would not consider to require certainty, um, back office services, et cetera. But those that are connected to strategic goods, yes. Is there any way that you separate these two categories so that the result for services might be a little more uh, granular? And uh, I don't know. Uh, given that services are now over 50% of world trade on a value-added basis, I know it's hard to deal with them sometimes, but now we, we can, you know, dissect them a little bit more carefully. I would think that maybe some kind of um, investigation into the role they play might be uh, a little bit more, more disaggregated, more better defined. And... Um, then I also wondered about the, the kind of what I felt to be somewhat tepid conclusion. Seemed to me, I could be wrong, that the paper was a little bit lukewarm in its conclusion that the reduction of multilateral uncertainty can lessen the impacts um, that you've shown on trade. Um, I don't know, it would be, it would seem to me that reduction of multilateral uncertainty could have a bigger impact than what seemed to be the outcome of the paper, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, maybe a comment on that. And then, yes, I would second Jonathan's uh, recommendation for the preparation of a non-expert executive summary, particularly if you want this to reach policymakers. I think that would be very, very nice and extremely useful. And those are my comments. And I just want, once again, to um, thank you for the presentation and for bringing it to the FMG. Sorry, I was dropped out by my internet. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry. Please, can we uh, have some answers from Adam and, or Michele? Why we prepare more, more questions? Maybe yes, let so, me go first. Oh, ah, sorry, okay. Adam, do you want to go first? No, go, go ahead and I can. Oh. Uh, yeah, let, let me go first, and then uh, 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 Adam obviously will complement, uh, provide more details. Um, no, just first that uh, uh, I, I take the point on the executive summary. So that, that that's this is a paper that was prepared for the working paper series of the IMF, which is traditionally the the, the place where we put the more technical stuff. So um, um, I, I agree with you that we should prepare. A, that an excited summary or, or a box EU blog that would uh, make it more digestible. Uh, and I'm sorry, that um, so point well, well taken. Um, a 
a couple of quick reactions. So the first one, and um, uh, Adam mentioned it at the beginning, uh, you know, when, uh, with the motivation about uh, uh, Montesquieu. And uh, so one, one, one of the things that we are trying to say with this paper, and I want to be very explicit about this, uh, that um, uh, there is a, a, a key role for the multilateral trade system. Um, and it is the fact that the, a function in multilateral trade system, a function in WTO, uh, reduces uh, uh, trade policy uncertainty. And by reducing trade policy uncertainty, it can uh, um, increase uh, uh, trade independently of uh, geopolitical uh, um, alliances. So trend, uh, trade with friends and non friends, and thus contributed to world peace. So there is a big public good element, uh, which uh, is uh, 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 emphasized in this paper as a side product of the fact that uh, when uh, this uh, multilateral uncertainty increases, uh, countries are more likely to trade with France and therefore uh, trade can contribute less to world peace. So that's, that's, that's the uh, sort of the, the big uh, message that uh, emphasizes once again an important Public good aspect of the multilateral system and the and the WTO. Um, so I just wanted to, to make sure that this this is clear. Uh, a couple of specific points. Um, the first one on the distinction between uh, geographic distance and geopolitical distance that Jonathan was uh, was emphasizing. The the technique that uh, is used here with the gravity modeling and the use of the uh, fixed attack structure allows us to do precisely that. So we, we the impact that we find is, uh, um, uh, it does not depend on things like geographic distance because these are controlled for in the, in the regression. So this is like the additional effect that, that uh, pure um, geopolitical distance uh, would create on, uh, on, on trade. So that's 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 one of the aspects that the econometric analysis can actually um, uh, speak to. Um, now, obviously, keeping in mind the the limitations that Bernard had earlier on the actual measures of geopolitical distance, but uh, but uh, the the econometric al analysis allows to isolate these these effects. Now, on services. Uh, I agree. So first of all, and Adam was quite explicit about this in the presentation, you know, the quality of data that we have on services, not we, Adam and I, but uh, we collectively, uh, is much, much poorer than the quality of data that we have on goods. And so uh, this is something that international organizations struggle with because we all understand that we should do more in terms of data collection. Um, uh, than uh, to have more than what we currently have. Uh, so we cannot say with certainty that uh, the results that we have are due to the fact that we have a much smaller sample for services trade, or if there is something specific about services. What we were discussing in the paper is that if we believe the results, and so we say this is not a, just a byproduct of having poorer quality data, it somehow makes sense that services uh, are a bit different. And one other thing that we were discussing in the paper is the fact that uh, mm, you know, geopolitical distance per se might directly affect uh, uh, services trade. So think of tourism as an example. Uh, you know, when there are uh, ten geopolitical tensions, it's much more difficult to, to get uh, visas to go visit a country. Or in any case, uh, there can be alerts in the US to get them all, all the times to not visit the country because it's not. Uh, so, so, and like this, this applies to, to tourism, but maybe applies also to uh, health services uh, uh, and, um, and other things. So again, uh, I completely agree with the point. There's something to investigate further, uh, both in terms of gaining more data and uh, once the data are available, also trying to uh, understand what are the, the, the specific channels, which is what Sherry was mentioning. So let me stop here and Adam, and Adam also feel uh, free to go back to some of Bernard's comments as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think you know, Michele covered uh, 
pretty well. Uh, so uh, the, the 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 two two last comments. Uh, I don't have much to add there. I think for the um, one one thing that uh, was mentioned is the impact of uh, uncertainty versus actual um, uh, trade restrictions. So the it's it's um, not necessarily that uncertainty has a larger impact. It's like it works in different ways because it causes a causes a delay in um, delay in action for, by by firms. And uh, and once this is resolved, uh, uh, even if it is resolved with a concrete policy, then if it's a tariff, you you pay the tariff, but you know that it's there, uh, which might reduce trade somewhat. But but then uncertainty is really like uh, it works. Uh, Work slightly differently. Also, at uh, you can think of firms entering markets and, and, and things like that. Where, whereas the tariff, maybe that's you know, or slightly less makes things slightly more expensive and and uh, and and people buy slightly less because of price effects. But, but it's it's really a different uh, a different mechanism. Um, in Berlin's comments, I thought um, one good uh, idea to try is the difference between the WTO notifications and, and what is in the GTA data. Because in a way, this is uh, where transparency might be linked somehow to, to uncertainty. But I think transparency in and of itself is interesting to uh, to test. Because um, one, one thing that, that comes up very often in, in the, the policy discussion is, is, is there enough information on uh, a variety of things. So it's partly, you know, uh, firms need firms need uh, to to form their their uh, their opinions. So it's partly related to uncertainty, but it's also the availability of of, of this information. Um, so that that's something that, that that we could we could look into if it's possible to uh, to flag certain measures which are if they're they're covered both at the WTO notified both at the WTO and in the GTA data then it's kind of common knowledge but uh, but if it's only in, in in the GTA data then it might be uh, uh, yeah then there, there might be more uncertainty about it um, then of course I agree that the highlighting the the regional trade agreements uh, more in the text or possibly interacting that with uncertainty. I mean, regional trade agreements themselves kind of uh, protect against this global trade policy uncertainty in a sense that it's like an extra layer of uh, uh, extra layer of, um, of of protection, legally speaking, because uh, you, you would have to kind of uh, um, reverse more than one uh, uh, on more than one uh, policy so so that could be something to to explore more uh, as well and of course I agree with the uh, try, trying to look at more robust uh, measures and, and creating more robust measures of uncertainty um, that, that's something we were thinking of so let me stop there um, I don't know if there's uh, anything else that that I, I might have forgotten, please. Uh, let me know. Thank you, Adam and Michele, for the answers. And if there's any comments, I think you put uh, a very interesting point as a corollary of your paper is the issue that we have to strengthen the the role of WTO in 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 this moment. But what as we see is that on the other hand, the growth of agreements are more than FTAs are agreements on particular issues on investment, on uh, environmental issues that are related with trade. There are this explosion of new issues that are, 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 are appearing may improve the ability of, 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 of WTO to handle a better environment for with less uncertainty or not? Because what we see is that it's this explosion of different areas in which we see agreements on particular issues is increasing a lot. And it was pointed by a recent paper also from the World Bank and WTO and IMF. So I will see that this is important to, to address too. What do you think about that, Adam and, and Michele? And anyone, please, if you want to address 
issues on how we can strengthen the, the ability of WTO to reduce the risk and uncertainty. No, I think that, that uh, so the, uh, your point, uh, Mercedes, is, is the point. So the fact that uh, um, the, the, the weakening of uh, the WTO um, is one of the reasons why we see um, uncertainty um, increasing. And, and so I would turn it around, you know, things like, uh, re-establishing a fully functioning dispute settlement system uh, is an incredibly important uh, um, uh, issue to deal with because that's, that's how you um, reduce uh, trade policy uh, uncertainty. Um, so that, uh, that, that I think is the point. But we're, what we are adding here is that uh, um, this is uh, especially important if we want trade to function um, as we would hope it functions, which is allowing to trade with uh, everyone, not just with, with friends, and therefore contributing to, uh, to peace. So that's the, the, the public good element of, of this. So let me take it from a completely different angle. If, if we look at um, historical examples, uh, um, uh, so obviously the, the database that we, the data that we use are this uh, trade uncertainty and, uh, and uh, overall uncertainty index that uh, is much more in recent times and it doesn't go back uh, uh, hundreds of years. But uh, there have been people that have been using uh, different approaches in particular there is this paper that we cite uh, is from American Economic Review and it was produced by economists at the Federal Reserve, and they look at um, geopolitical uh, risk. And that they use, instead of using the Economist Intelligence Unit, they use uh, newspaper articles and they go back in time by, by decades. And it wouldn't be surprising to anybody to realize that uh, the periods in the 30s uh, was a period of uh, very, very high uh, geopolitical uh, risk. Um, not, not surprising to, to anybody. Um, now, if we look at what happened in that period, is that uh, trade became much more regionalized. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there is another article by uh, Kevin O'Rourke and co-authors, again, on American Economic Review, that uh, looks specifically at that. So everyone obviously talks about the fact that trade collapsed uh, over that period. We know that. The point that they add is that uh, trade became also much more regional. So that, uh, for instance, the UK, um, the share of uh, trade that it was doing with uh, other countries in the Commonwealth uh, went up in a period of less than 10 years uh, from 30% to 40%. Um, now, this is overall trade contracted, but the share that they did with uh, the, the regional partners, so the partners in the economy went, went uh, substantially up, and this was true for uh, for um, uh, several other um, groupings. So that's that's exactly what uh, uh, what we're talking about here. No, that uh, in periods of uh, of uh, uncertainty, um, there is this uh, tendency of uh, um, moving away from multilateral trade and global trade and back to uh, trading with friends. And so that's, that's, uh, um, that's the point. Thank you, Michele. Yeah, it's a very nice way to present it uh, with a very technical paper that I really enjoy it. Um, I don't know if there's any more comments, questions. We have still some time to, to have more conversations on it. And I think we don't have to focus only on the paper, but also is this possibilities of improving our abilities to have a better uh, WTO uh, to reduce uncertainty? Well, I think one thing, if I can come in, it's, um, yeah, this is kind of my uh, soapbox speech, so I will not do the speech, but just in general, I think there's a lot that could be done by the Secretariat, 
right? And of course, for that, they need to be kind of given a mandate to do it. But if you think about all this uncertainty text, that is the basis for this uncertainty indicator that is used in the paper, you know, it's essentially people tracking what's being said in newspapers in a particular country. And then that's kind of put together in a few paragraphs, right? And then this word uncertainty is what is actually counted, which gives you the index. But obviously what matters is what you said yourself, I think, is to separate the signal from the noise, right? So there's a lot of potentially things that could be happening. There's a lot of things that are being bandied about by government, in the press, what have you. But how much of that actually materializes, right? And then once it materializes, you know, what does it actually do, right? So if, if it doesn't really add up to a lot, then yes, there might be uncertainty. But if firms know that, in fact, you know, this is pretty marginal, okay, that's important information for them. So I think doing more to actually look at and track regularly, you know, what is potentially being put forward to assess whether or that actually has been put in place. And that's very different from the very long lagged trade policy review mechanism, right? So some of this could be done in, in, in the annual kind of exercise of what's happening in, in the world in terms of trade policy. But, you know, that only really is useful, I think, if you actually add analysis to it. So it's not just documenting or counting the number of times we see something, but it's you know, what, 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 is, what is the effect? And I think a lot of the uncertainty that firms confront is the same uncertainty we have, which is to ask the question, is this important? Is it not? How does it affect me? Right? So then if you're risk averse, you might be taking decisions that, in fact, you don't need to take, even if it happens. Right, so kind of informing that decision-making process is something that could usefully be done um, by by the secretariat. But again, they need to be liberated and permitted to do that. Thank you, Bernie. I have a problem with my internet, so I miss a little bit of your presentation and comment. But please, Jonathan. Well, thanks to all for the observations, just a couple of uh, quick uh, takes to compliment. Um, uh, Bernard's uh, uh, emphasis on uh, comparing uh, global trade alerts versus what's actually notified, you need to fill that in with uh, one additional data uh, set, which is the specific trade concerns, because whether or not notified, uh, uh, a measure being brought to the attention of members through STC procedures uh, adds to the common uh, knowledge and, and publicity uh, surrounding potential barriers. So it's a, it's a more complete inventory to be had. Second, uh, I'd have a look at James Zahn's uh, latest product, the World Investment Report is looking at shifts in uh, outward uh, investment and destinations uh, being, uh, whether you want to call it distorted or, or shifting in light of, of uh, current uh, trends. Third, on Mercedes' point of uh, the fact that we're witnessing not only regional trade agreements, but subject matter specific agreements across regions. And maybe a good example is a digital economy partnership agreement uh, the G7 and G20 discussions around AI principles and so on, and recalling uh, everything from the EU experience to CPTPP and RCEP to, of course, NAFTA and USMCA, uh, the optimist would say waiting for 164 countries to resolve uncertainty is going to take forever in most areas. Uh, look at where we are on e-commerce, look at what's happened to uh, services domestic regulation, look at the 20-year history of fisheries agreements. The positive side of RTAs and subject matter agreements is that they're catalysts. Uh, they can set as a vanguard where the world should be going, and others may see the benefits and catch up. A good number of the NAFTA provisions uh, negotiated uh, from uh, 90 to 92 did make their way into the final results of the Uruguay round when the rest of the world said, whoops, unless we uh, follow suit, 
it is going to break down into uh, blockism and uh, let's catch up. So there is a positive side to this concurrent uh, discussion among friends or like-minded uh, en route to ultimately multilateral uh, certainty that may, may result in the long term. Uh, so just some provocative observations. I'll stop there. Great, Jonathan, very provocative and very interesting. I don't know if the authors mm -hmm. have comments. Yeah, can I jump in? Uh, yes, no, thanks again. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying this, uh, this, this conversation. I think it's very, very interesting. Uh, I want to pick up both on the point that Bernard made and the one by, by Jonathan. Um, so uh, I completely agree with Bernard on the fact that so uncertainty is there. We're not going to get rid of uncertainty. Uncertainty exists uh, because there are uh, geopolitical tensions, uh, because uh, there are policy announcements, and then policies are changed. So some uncertainty is always going to be there. Um, but uh, in addition to having a, a, a function in this settlement, uh, the WTO as a system could do more if uh, it would enhance uh, is uh, uh, monitoring of policies, which is essentially what uh, uh, Bernard uh, is suggesting. Um, I think that's that's uh, uh, it's a very important point. By the way, I don't think the WTO uh, only should be doing this. I mean, all international organizations should should play their part uh, uh, from their point of view. But I I, uh, I agree with that. I mean the. Uh, if we think about the successful systems that we had uh, in uh, recent years, uh, uh, a lot of it was about reducing uncertainty. So when uh, the food crisis uh, erupted in uh, first 2008 and then uh, 2011 and 12, what the global community did, which I think was very, very good, is to create uh, the uh, AMIS uh, the system, which was uh, to improve information on, uh, on um, uh, food production and improve information on policies. And I think that uh, played a very important positive role in reducing uncertainty and um, uh, calming things uh, over time. Of course, tensions came up uh, um, again with COVID, but uh, I think the system uh, played a very useful role. Right now, if we think about it, we have a similar type of tensions for critical minerals. In critical minerals, there is a lot of uncertainty on production reserves. Very often, this uh, you know there are new names that come up in the news of minerals that we never heard of, but they are critical because they are needed for environmental technologies or or semiconductors and other uh, digital technologies. And again, there is uncertainty on production. There is uncertainty on policies. And anything that can be done, an AMIS type system for critical minerals would be very, very useful in reducing uncertainty. So all, all these ideas that can reduce uncertainty would play um, an, uh, an important role. Now, the second thought that I had is, uh, it relates to what uh, um, Jonathan was saying. And, and here, I, I wanna be clear. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, if a group of countries uh, uh, go ahead um, and negotiate uh, new rules uh, in a regional trade agreements, um, this creates uncertainty. I don't think this is a bad kind of uncertainty. I think in, in some sense, this uh, is, is a good kind of uncertainty because they, they innovate. And um, so one of the things uh, that uh, I sort of realized over time studying regional trade agreements is that regional trade agreements can work as states in a federal system. In a, in a federal system, you have that state can, can innovate. And as a, a justice at the Supreme Court of the US put it many, many years ago, they work as laboratory of, um, of legal innovations. So regional trade agreements play the same role. Of course, this comes with some uncertainty, but that's, that's an acceptable kind of uncertainty because as uh, Jonathan pointed out um, these innovations can be successful and can be then replicated at the multilateral level. So it's in that sense, not, not all uncertainties uh, 
is bad. So let me let me stop here and thanks thanks again for this uh, uh, provoking thoughts. I have another raised hand by Mr. Alfla Alfaro. Thank you. Uh, I'm William Alfaro from the WTO Secretariat. And I, I've heard reference to the secretariat, and I guess it's WTO secretariat. So I just want to to make two comments. One, I I, I seem to have heard that some uh, remarks comparing uh, notifications at the WTO and the information provided by the Global Trade Alert GTA. Uh, I don't think we can compare both because the coverage and the methodology are totally different. Uh, notifications are a legal obligations uh, where uh, members have to notify what is notifiable, I would say. Global Trade Alert is a different uh, exercise, very useful exercise. But in between uh, the two, uh, the Secretariat has a, another uh, tool, which is the trade monitoring. The trade monitoring exercise, that these are reports by the Director General, go beyond notifications, much beyond notifications. And they are more up to date than a notification. Sometimes notifications uh, come very late. Now, the methodology uh, that we have in the trade monitoring exercise, and it's something like uh, Bernard was saying, uh, we don't rely uh, um, blindly on press reports. Uh, we know that some press reports may, may be correct, exact, some others may not be. So the way we do is we collect this information and we submit for verification by the members. So the end result of the trade monitoring report is solid information. Of course, Global Trade Alert has more. Uh, they have more flexibility. Now, I believe the real situation is in between the two. If we want to count how many trade restrictions have been put in place over a certain period of time. It's not less what the Secretariat says. It's not more than what GTA says. Maybe not. It's in between. It's in between. So uh, uh, I would invite uh, you to, to look at the most recent uh, trade monitoring report issued by the Director General earlier this week on the G20. And there is a database uh, available on the Secretariat website also that provides this information. So it's another uh, complement to the efforts as increasing transparency. We believe that by increasing transparency, we reduce somehow uncertainty. So this is the, 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 the comments I wanted to make. And thanks for the presentation to Michele, Bernard, and, and the others. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Afra Mr. Alfaro. Very interesting to know that we have this kind of information. If there is any other comment. Well, then we have a little bit more time, but if we, we want to, to wrap up this, I think this paper is really important. I really enjoy reading it, even though it's very statistic for some of us. I'm an economist, so I like it. The, the way it was presented because very simple and very uh, uh, straight to the point, but it's true. Uh, translation for common language, I, I, it will be fantastic, really. I really enjoy it. And there's a lot of possibilities also what is opening with this paper in, in terms of analysis and, 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 and research for further work. So I really enjoy your work, Adam and Kelly. Uh, really congratulations. And I think this presentation here can contribute with ideas for your, for your work. Thank you, Bernard, too, because your comments were very provoking, very good uh, to the point. And as all the comments that we receive here, I think they're very useful for the paper, but also for our future work as FMG. Uh, unfortunately, Mr. Lou, Dr. Professor Lou is not here. He excuses himself for not being with us. But uh, as you know, FMG is open to this kind of discussions and, and work for the future to improve uh, the work that we have in, and the ability to have this public good, which is having a strong WTO. Thank you to all of you for participating in this meeting. I'll see you in another meeting like this for these interesting conversations. Thank you so much uh, to you and to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you soon. I'll see you in Florence. I'll see you in Florence, Bernard, for sure. Yep. October. <laughs> October. It will be great. See you. Bye-bye.